You are about to listen to a message from Apostle Joseph Minter of Touch World Ministries International. Be blessed. The economy of grace. The word economy is the Greek word oikonomia. Oikonomia simply means management of a household. When we talk about uh, economy, we are talking about the dispensation or how grace is dispensed. God's ultimate aim God's major plan right from eternity, right from the, ma- the time man was created was to dispense himself into man, into man for three things, for man's enjoyment, for man's building up, and for man's expression of his glory. and a privilege to come and sit at your feet even as your word is coming we pray that you help us to open our hearts to receive your word let your word come forth with great power and might and let your word have a place to stay and flourish in our hearts we thank you in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Hallelujah we are grateful to God for today and you're all welcome. Today is 19th September 2021. And uh, we thank God for his goodness and his mercies. Amen. Um, we are looking at the economy of grace. The economy of grace. And uh, this is the 22nd part of the series uh, on the deliverance systems of the believer, the 22nd part in the series. Last week, we looked at the throne of grace. The reason why I'm I'm teaching this one, this one is more like a connecting message to the next phase of the teachings on the deliverance system, because I'm going to be touching on intercession and uh, supplication, and then the court system, standing, standing, uh, in his courts. So this, these, these messages on grace, they are connecting messages. But I want to take advantage and also do justice to the subject of grace, which is very important in our lives as believers. So last week we saw that everything is calibrated from the throne of God. 
And uh, we saw that the throne of God, God has always been seated on the throne of grace. Even in the Old Testament, God was on the throne of grace. And uh, grace is God's nature, which, uh, which, which cannot change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we saw that grace flows from the throne of God. And uh, we also looked at seven different um, aspects of the grace of God. We saw the saving grace, teaching grace, sustaining grace, enabling grace, dispensational grace, commanding grace, and then all grace, which is a combination of all. And today we are looking at the economy of grace. And the word economy is the Greek word oikonomia. Oikonomia simply means management of a household. Management of a household. And that word is used in scripture many, many times. Like Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 2, verse 2. Uh, well, let, let's read from verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. That word dispensation is the word oikonomia, which is the word economy, which is the word administration or the management of the grace of God that was given to me for you. That's what Paul is saying. Another, another word, another place where the word is used is in, is in 1 Timothy 1.4. But I'm going to read that one. 1 Timothy 1.4, um, he was talking about, okay, let's, let's read. It, it doesn't hurt reading that one. First Timothy 1 4. It says, um, Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now, that, that word for edification is that same word, oikonomia. Oikonomia. Uh, uh, it's, it's a derivative of that word, and uh, it means a building, edifice, structure. So when we talk about uh, economy, we're talking about the dispensation or how grace is dispensed, how it is dispensed, you know, how it is dispensed. And we, we, we know that God's ultimate aim, God's major plan right from eternity, right from the, the time man was created, was to dispense himself into man, into man for three things, for man's enjoyment, for man's building up, and for man's expression of his glory. That was God's intent. That was, that was what God initially wanted to achieve with Adam. You know, So the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden was supposed to have been served or administered to Adam and by so doing, the life of God and the nature of God dispensed into man. For man's enjoyment, for man's building or edification, and for man's expression. Man was ultimately supposed to express the glory of God. You know, but then uh, God would dispense his nature into man. Then man would express his nature out. Now, uh, in, in God's economy, or uh, in God's administrative system, the father, the father is always the source. The father is always the source. Um, the son is always the agent or the, um, the administrator or the container. Okay. Then the spirit is always the supplier. Supplier or the executor. So you see in God's system that Everything flows from the Father. The Father is portrayed uh, as the source of all things, of whom are all things, all things. So when he talks about the Father, he's talking about the source. Uh, the Son is the administrator, the medium, you know, the medium, okay, the content, the container and the content. Then the Spirit is the supplier. That is why... Uh, and, and you see, even, even in the creation of man, you see uh, something very interesting. The father created man uh, from himself. You know, the Bible says that God 
God created man in his own image after his likeness. Uh, male, female created he them. So he created man as a spirit out of nothing. Out of nothing. Man did not exist. You know, man never existed. Man came out of God's own spirit. God's own spirit. Then the son, who at that time was the um, he was he was pre-incarnate, so he was not Jesus. He was the Son, uh, uh, the Word, as we see in First John five seven and eight, that there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. So the Father created man as a spirit. Then the Word, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who at that time was referred to as the Lord God, also took over. And then formed the body of man. So in Genesis 2 verse 7, you, you will see the first introduction of the second person of the Trinity as the Lord God. That's the first time you, you hear or you see that, that phrase or that title, the Lord God, appearing in the Bible. It says, and the Lord God, that was referring to the, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who later became the Lord Jesus, right? At that time, he was, he was the Lord God. And then he was the one who formed man of the dust and breathe into man into man the breath of life for man to become a living being that that was the second stage of creation okay so the third stage would have been completed by the spirit the, the spirit of god the, the spirit who also became the holy spirit okay the spirit now so that third stage should have been that the spirit who is a supplier of life would take the tree of life and give it to adam and then the evolution or the process would have been complete. Now, man would have been a spirit, you know, created in the image of God, having a body by containing the very life of God, which was symbolized by the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. So, the first two happened. The third did not happen. The third did not happen because uh, instead of the tree of life, man went ahead of God and partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so, in place of life, uh, death was what came. And so, the plan had to change. Now, when I say the plan had to change, uh, the plan was already there, even in eternity. Before Adam was created, God knew that Adam was going to sin. And the plan of salvation was already crafted in eternity before man even came on the scene. So, when Adam sinned, the plan was only unveiled. Now, when it comes to the earth realm, we will say the plan changed. But in eternity, with the eternal realm, the plan did not change. The plan was only unveiled. So now the plan was that now before man could have access to the tree of life or life, man had to be cleansed of sin. So now instead of uh, God giving man the tree of life, God desired to come with a lamb, a lamb to cleanse man from the filth of sin before man will be granted access to the tree of life again. So is the Holy Spirit, Bible says in John 63, it said, the flesh profits nothing, but the Spirit gives life. It's the Spirit that gives life. So the Spirit is the one who supplies life. Okay. Now, these three uh, entities, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we see the administration, the outworking of the plan of God through these three entities uh, in God's economy. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, uh, you will see the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Look at what the Apostle Paul said. Okay, he said, there are, there are diversities of gifts by the same spirit. Diversities of gifts by the same spirit. Or, or diversities of, of, of manifestation. Okay, the same spirit. Okay. Uh, there are differences of ministries, ministries, but the same Lord, Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God. So, the Father is to activities, the source. The Son is to ministries. The Spirit is to manifestations. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, uh, you will hear the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship 
of the Holy Spirit. So these three entities, they are always uh, together when it comes to God's economy. And uh, the Father has a role he plays. The Son has a role he plays. The Spirit has a role he also plays. And they say that the love of God, the, the source of love is the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So, but the, the grace, the source of grace is the Son. The Son. So the love of God poured into the Son, became grace, and uh, the Spirit is also the supplier. So the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who supplies grace to us. The Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, let me give you a definition of grace. I think I've, I've told you before. This is what I, I, I see grace as. It is the fullness of God's riches. The fullness of God's riches. Dispensed into man. The fullness of God's riches. Dispensed into man. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Because he's a supplier. Under the auspices of the finished work of Christ. So grace. I define grace as this. The fullness. Full. Fullness of God's riches. Dispensed into mankind. Through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Under the auspices, which means that it was made possible by the finished work of Christ. What the Holy Spirit dispenses into us is a possibility because of what Christ has already accomplished. That is my definition of grace. So, the release of God into man, the release of God, dispensation of God into man, that is what that is all that grace is about. The release of God into man. That is all that grace is about. Now, God is rich. The Bible, you see, we can't, we can't even begin to fathom the riches of God. God is so rich. He's so rich. Uh, the Bible talks about the riches of his grace. Uh, Ephesians 2, 7, riches of his mercy. Ephesians 2, 4, riches of his glory. Ephesians 3, 16, Philippians 4, 19, riches of his goodness. Romans 2, 4. So God is always rich. He's always rich. He's the source of all things. We can never exhaust anything that comes from God. Whether it is his grace, his mercy, his goodness, his uh, kindness, his glory, and any virtue, any of these riches, you can dwell on them for all eternity. I mean, look at, even look at the universe that God created. Now, science is telling us that the universe keeps on expanding, expanding. Science is trying to catch up with God, you know, and it's not easy for them because they are saying that the thing keeps on expanding. What I believe is happening is that they have not yet fully exhausted God's universe because you can't simply exhaust God. He's infinite, you know, and then also he's inexhaustible. God, you, you can't. You, there's no way you can get to the end of God. No way. You know, if you take the virtues of God, if you take one virtue of God, you see that it is pregnant with several other virtues. You can take wisdom alone. Wisdom alone is pregnant with other virtues. If you take love alone, if you take faith alone, if you take grace alone, you see it's pregnant with other virtues. So therefore, we can't really exhaust the knowledge of God. We can't. We can never finish knowing God. That is why he has prepared us for eternity. Because only eternity will be capable of um, accommodating our spirit, our potential. Only eternity. In time, we can't, we can't know God that much. In time, even when we leave this body and we go to heaven, we will see that our minds are infinitely, you know, like uh, enhanced, enhanced to understand certain things. There are things that you understand clearly, certain spiritual concepts that you, 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 you struggle to 
get the meaning of you know on on earth in time in eternity your your mind will be touched so that you can grasp it you can understand it there are things that we struggle to understand even though we claim we understand we don't understand from I mean, fully something like the the love of god the grace of god we 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 claim we understand but we we don't because these are these are inexhaustible virtues of god authority for instance human beings do not understand authority as as those in eternity you know glory all these words are words that are very very rich very rich now so the father wanting to dispense himself into man decided to fully release himself into the son for the son to carry out that operation through the spirit so the father expressed himself in christ fully fully that's why jesus uh, came as god the god that they could not see he came as emmanuel god with us it's like somebody speaking on the radio and the person coming out you know on the radio you hear his voice you don't see his face but then the person coming out to meet you say, oh, I was the one who was speaking on the radio. So if you want to know God, you have to look at Jesus. Because he is the exact representation, the truest, the truest reflection of the character of God is Jesus Christ. The God who was speaking to them on the radio, who they could not see, no one can ever see. And even in fact, no one has ever seen him, that God. The invisible God, nobody can see and nobody has ever seen. The only person who has seen him is Jesus. Yes. Jesus is the only person who has seen him. He said, no one has ever seen the Father at any time except the Son whom the Father has given. You know, so, so, so Jesus is the exact representation, the truest reflection, the the truest manifestation of the character and the nature of God. In fact, let me not even waste words. Come to Hebrews. Let me allow Hebrews to, to tell you what, I, what I'm trying, I'm struggling to tell you. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, the brightness, the radiance of his glory and the express image, express image means the exact copy of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus is the express image of the Father. Now in John chapter, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible says Jesus Christ is the one who gives us understanding to know the Father. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. The true God, you will never see him. You in, in the Old Testament, when, when we say Moses saw God, he never saw God like God is known. In fact, what Moses even saw at the burning bush was an angel. It wasn't God. Our God is a consuming fire, not a fire that has not consumed. Uh, the, 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 the bush was not being consumed. It was on fire but not being consumed. So it was an angel of the Lord that manifested to Moses. All those who saw God in the Old Testament, they never saw God. Because Jesus Christ said that no one has ever seen God at any time except the Son. What it means is that no one truly knows God except the Son. Therefore, if you want to know God, you have to look at the Son. That is why I always say that Jesus is perfect theology. Whatever he did, whatever he said, should be our standard. The New Testament is not based on the epistles. 
it is based on the person and the, and the character and the words of Jesus. What they did in the epistles were to merely expound on what Jesus Christ taught. All the revelation of Paul, everything was upon the person of Jesus. Because Jesus Christ, Jesus, is the son and he is the exact representation of the father. The father expressed himself through Christ. Now, Jesus Christ, the son, the word that is associated with him in scripture is fullness. 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 Colossians 1.19. Colossians 1.19. So, uh, your revelation of Christ will determine how much of God you get. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. What fullness? The fullness of the Godhead. Okay, come to 2 verse 9. 2 verse 9. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything about God was in Christ. He was full of Christ, of God. That is why when, you see, and I said that grace is the riches of God, the fullness of his riches dispensed into man. Now, that fullness of God was bestowed, was, it was in Christ before it was dispensed. I've already talked about that. So in John 1 verse 14, you know the, the gospel of John chapter 1, it, talk, it starts with, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was expressed as light. Are you following? Just follow. In him was life, and the life was expressed as light. Now, write it down. Life is grace. Light is glory. Just put it down somewhere. I'll come back to that. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Okay? In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now, when you come to verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. That means that if you squeeze him, what will come out of him is grace and truth. Now, with this, it means that the nature of the Father is grace and truth. The word truth simply means reality. Reality. See, Jesus is the one who brought the reality of God's grace. In the Old Testament, they had aspects of God. They had aspects of God. For instance, in the Old Testament, you will see people with aspects of the wisdom of God. Solomon had aspects of the wisdom of God. Daniel, Joseph had aspects of the wisdom of God. They had, they had it in bits and pieces, aspects. You know, Solomon had an aspect of the glory of God. David had an aspect of the honor or glory of God. Samson had an aspect of the spirit of might. In the Old Testament, they had aspects, aspects of God. The grace of God was released in bits and pieces. In fact, the only thing about grace they had in the Old Testament was favor. Favor. That was all. In the Old Testament, the, the definition of grace in the Old Testament was favor. And Noah found grace in the sight of God. Moses said, if I found grace in your sight, show me your glory. You know, and Moses found grace in the sight of God. So that aspect of grace that was, that was manifested in the Old Testament was favor. But Jesus Christ came with the full component of God. Whether it's wisdom, whether it's glory, whether it's grace, whether it's strength, whether it's power, whether it's riches, whether it's blessing, whether it's honor. 
Jesus came with a full complement, components of God. Hello? So, when Jesus came on the scene, he was always full of, full of, full of, full of wisdom, full of power, full of grace, full of glory, full, full, full. Fullness is always linked to Christ. So, John 1 verse 16, okay, 14 says that, I read 14, the verse 16, and of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. Uh, other than it says, we have received grace upon grace, which means that you can receive, your, your recession of grace is also in measures. Hello? It's in measures. Grace upon grace. But his, Jesus was full of grace. He, he was not given a measure of grace. He is grace himself, personified, full of grace. Okay, so in Ephesians 4 verse 13, you, we talk about fullness. Okay, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4 verse 13 talks about the fullness of him. Um, okay, the fullness of Christ. So we all come to the nature of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3 talks about the fullness of Christ. You know, the, the fullness of him that fills all in all. 1, 1 verse 23. 1 verse 23. Okay. Uh, verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, and so on and so forth. Ephesians 3 verse 19 talks about the fullness of, of God. The fullness. To know the love of God, Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The love of Christ has four sides. It's a keyword. It has um, the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height. The, the length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of the love of God is, is in Christ. You know, that's what we're talking about. Then he said that if you know this love, that is how it can be full of God. The fullness of God. So, the Father dispensed himself into Christ. And Christ came on the scene with the fullness of God. The repository of the fullness of the riches of God. That's why Jesus Christ, when, when, he, when he blessed them and that he multiplied bread for them, and then they said that our fathers did eat manna, what sign, what sign do you also show? Then he said that, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In other words, what you ate in the wilderness was fragments. Fragments. Okay? You ate fragments. You, you ate the, 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 the fragments. I am the whole meal. Which if you eat, you will never go hungry. I am the bread of life. Anyone who eats me will never die. You will live forever. That is why Jesus was bold. Bold. You know, bold to make certain statements. Because he was the fullness of God. He said, apart from me, there's no hope. Apart from me, there's no life. Apart from me, there's no love. Apart from me, there's no grace. Nothing. So the Father released himself into Christ. Then the Father and the Son also release themselves into the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was the one who entered us for our enjoyment. Number two, our building up. Number three, our expression. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of grace. That, that element of God that is dispensed into man is called grace. Hello? The end result of that dispensation of grace is spirit and life. Because when Jesus Christ came, you see, when Jesus was born, uh, he, he went through a process. The first, the first stage of the process was incarnation. Now, incarnation is when God became man through Jesus Christ. When Mary, what Mary gave birth to was a human being called Jesus. 
and that human being was God with us, Emmanuel. So that's the first step, incarnation, God coming as man. So in Isaiah 9, 6, that same person who was the child and the son given, that same person was the mighty God, eternal father. So the father dispensed himself into the son as a human being. And Jesus came as man who was the embodiment of all the fullness of God, representing mankind also. So God had achieved what he, he set out to achieve in the Garden of Eden in Christ. What he did not achieve in Adam, he had achieved in Christ. That is why he was so excited at Jordan. This is my beloved son. You know, I've produced a man at last that I can say that I dwell in. And Jesus Christ said that the Father dwells in me. The Father who dwells in me, he does the very works you see. John 14, in my father's house, there are many mansions. You know, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. Then in verse 10, he says, I, the father dwells in me. The father abides, menu, Greek, in me. Which means that I am the father's house. This, all this I've taught them before in 2016. So, <laughs> those who have been listening to 2016, you, you, are not, you are familiar with all these things. That when he said in my father's house, he was not referring to heaven. I think I preached it under the message. Um, Jesus is both Savior and Lord. You can check it, check it and see. Okay. <laughs> now, then his human living, he living as man, ordinary, I mean, normal human being. Okay. Then his death, the next stage was his death. Then his burial and resurrection. Where he was raised from the dead, resurrected from the dead, what he became was a life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. Just follow me because I'm about to take off. Some of you, if you don't follow me and I take off, you will lose me. <laughs> you will lose me. Okay. Now, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So the end of the process was that the father released himself into the son. And the son went through the process of incarnation, human living, death, burial, resurrection, and became a life-giving spirit. This, this thing too, I taught it in 2016. I preach a message called, it's all in a seed. It's all in a seed. And I took you through this whole process. So I'm not teaching anything new. It's just a rehash of, of the old thing. So the life-giving spirit is a spirit that gives life. What The one we call the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me not but you see, The one we call the Holy Spirit is the end product of a process. In the Old Testament, he was called the Spirit of God. Now, in the New Testament, he is called the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus, the one who introduced it, he said, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, he is the end of a process, the life-giving Spirit. He is the one who gives life. That's why Jesus, Christ, the, the Holy Spirit could not come to Jesus Christ having glorified. John 7, verse 37, uh, he said, On that last day of the feast, he stood and cried and said, all those who are thirsty, come to me and drink. Those who believe in me, as the scriptures have testified, out of their bellies will flow rivers of living water. This speak he of the spirit who those who believe in him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given his natalis because Christ had not yet been glorified. So the Holy Spirit could never have come until Christ had also released him. The Father, the Son, releasing the Spirit. So what the one we are dealing with now is the Spirit. He is the dispenser. He is the one who dispenses the fullness of God's riches. That was made available through the finished work of Christ into our lives. That is grace. That's why he is called the Spirit of grace. In the Bible, anytime grace was released, it was released as a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. 
Because it's a, it's a spiritual element, spiritual substance imparted into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, Jesus as a man cannot live in you. As a man, he can't live in you. That's why he had to die to release the spirit. So the spirit that lives in us is the spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. So Galatians 4 verse 6 and 7 say that because you are sons, God has sent for the spirit of the son to dwell in your heart who cries Abba, Father. The spirit of the son. That is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who dispenses the grace of God. That is why grace is connected to help. Because the Holy Spirit is the helper. Hallelujah. Are you following? Okay. So, grace is that divine substance of God that was dispensed into us by the Holy Spirit for our enjoyment, number one. Enjoyment means fellowship. Number two, building up. Number three, expression. So, write this down. Very important. <laughs> uh, write this down. Dr. Thomas Moore will say, write this down. Okay, so write it down. Grace configures identity. Grace configures identity. Determines. Authorizes. And empowers function. That is what grace does. Grace configures identity and then it determines function, authorizes function, and empowers function. Very profound statement. So, your identity is configured by the divine element called grace. You see, it said that according to his precious promises, he has given us a divine Precious promise that we may be partakers of his divine nature. Partakers of his divine nature. That is the, 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 the configuration of grace in us. God, the element of God in us is called grace. And then grace also determines our function. Which means that grace is released. Grace released to you will determine what you can do. What you can do is determined by grace. By that aspect of, of, of grace through Christ released into you. It said, uh, to each one, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Ephesians 4 verse 7. And to each one, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, grace determines your function. Then, grace authorizes and empowers your function. Hello? That is why grace is dispensed from a throne. A throne means authority, the throne of grace. So grace will authorize your function. That is why as a believer, you should never function outside of your grace allotment. Anytime you function outside of grace allotment, you attract unnecessary attacks. Because you are not protected. Okay, I'll get to that. Now, so grace is the fuel for God's purposes. The divine energy that fuels God's purpose is called grace. The divine energy that fuels God's purpose is called grace. And God's purposes, they are in two realms. In eternity and in time. So grace was given both in eternity and then time. In time, it is given in measures. But the reason why grace was given in eternity, um, open to Romans chapter 8, verse 29. You will see certain things that describe the ultimate purpose of God for us, the journey. Okay, so there are some words. Those he foreknew, he predestinated. Those he predestinated, he called. Those who he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. 
Do you see it in Romans 28, 29? Moreover, whom he predestined, these also he called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now, every step of this process, grace was released. Grace was released. Because grace is the fuel for God's purposes. Anything that God wants to do, what fuels it is called grace. Divine energy that fuels God's purposes is called grace. And, and, and you see, this, this foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification, all these things were fueled by grace. They are aspects of God's eternal purpose. Now, the foreknowledge took place without your knowledge. Foreknowledge. He said, those he foreknew. Foreknew. Before time. Before time began. He said, he chose us before time began to be holy and unblameable in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. So, that, that one took place without your knowledge. You did not know. Hello. Okay, so he foreknew you, and then he predestined you. Now, predestined means he, he packaged you. He packaged you. He settled on you. This was before your mother and your father met each other, you know, b- before all that time, before your great, 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 before Adam came on the scene. You are in God's mind. Now, I'm going to show you what the Bible says. All things work together for good. It's talking about these things. It's not about when you are going through hardship. It's about these things. Yes. These things. Now, all things work together for the good of those who are, what? Who love God. Who are, they called, not called, they called according to purpose. The called the, who are the called according to purpose, and the purpose is this so he foreknew you, then he predestined you. Predestination, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that later on, but what it means is that the father settled on you your, your ordination, your, gra- your grace allotment. Your calling, your gifting, your everything was already shaped in eternity. That's why he told Jeremiah that before you became a clot of blood in your mother's womb, I knew you and I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Not when you were born, no one hands were laid on you. When before you became a clot of blood in your mother's womb, he said, I sanctify you as a prophet to the nations. That is ordination. So, grace was given to us here before eternity. I mean, before time. In eternity, grace was given. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. That is why, you see, there are some people, even before they become born again, you see that there are certain things that you see in them. You see certain aspects, you know, of God in them. I mean, they will come to the Lord. One, uh, second, second Timothy, uh, one nine. Okay. It says that. Okay, let's read from verse eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us. And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Should I read it again? Okay. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, before creation started, before Adam was born. 
So we were chosen in Christ Jesus before time began. Before time began. And because grace is the fuel for God's purposes, grace was also released in eternity. Before time began. Now, so, the grace released in eternity before time began. That, wa- that, is, you see, that is why, that is why you, you were saved. That is why you received the gospel. That is why you became born again. It had been settled before you came. It had been settled before you came. You had been chosen before you came. There are some people, they will, they will be born again through very precarious circumstances. And it will, it will look as if they nearly missed it. But in the nick of time, at the skin of their teeth, they will receive the gospel. Why? Grace has been made available for all those who have been foreknown and predestined. Grace was given before time began. That's why the thief on the cross, at the last minute, obtained mercy. There are people that we will see in heaven and will be surprised. Because at the last minute, they obtained mercy because they had been foreknown and predestined. Someone will say, what about those? Don't, yeah, you, just thank God you have, you have been called. That's all. Just keep quiet and go your way. Don't, you are not people's spokes, spokesperson. <laughs> okay. Now, when we come to time, when we come to time, then we are called. When you are called, you will hear the gospel. You receive the gospel. That one too, grace is applied. That's why it says, for by grace you have, you have been saved through faith, not of your works, but by the grace of God. Hello? So in your calling, grace was released. Then through faith, I won't talk about that, that one today. Faith is a corresponding action to grace. Grace without faith will be wasted. Yeah. Faith without grace is, is barren. Grace without faith is futile. Because grace without faith is wasted, wasted. I mean, that is wasted. I'll talk about that. But for your call, you receive grace. Yo, you were saved by grace. Saved by what? Grace. Saved. Okay. Saved by grace. Somebody says saved with amazing grace. Swag. So, now, then we come to time. <laughs> in time, grace is also, because God's purpose is grace. So, in time, uh, grace, the grace of God shows itself uh, to, to save us. Not only that, to also build us so that we can express his glory. Hello? I hope you are following. So, the grace of God shows itself in time to save us. That is, that is why in time we have mercy. So, one of the expressions of grace in time is called mercy. In fact, two less of grace. I've thought about two less of grace. Mercy and help, right? So, one of the expressions of grace in time is mercy. That is the platform upon which God dealt with us when we were sinners and he saved us he saved us we, we didn't qualify for it he qualified us with his with his mercy and he saved us with his grace then when you come to the Lord it is grace also that builds you up so you see grace is not something that is just for salvation no 
In fact, it, it was given in eternity. That's why uh, in time you were able to receive the gospel. Then after that, grace was also given to build you up. Uh, Acts 20 verse 32. Acts 20 32. Okay, let's read Acts 20, 32. Let's all read. Ready, go. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. So, listen. Grace was given to us before time began, and then it made sure that we were we responded to the call, and, and and it saved us. We were saved by grace. Then now, grace also builds us up through the word, and grace gives us an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Which means that grace is what gave you your allotment in the body. That's why I said grace configures identity and then it also uh, authorizes and empowers function. It determines function. It authorizes function. It empowers function. Number one, it configures identity. That's why it was given to us before time began. Then we were saved by grace. Then Grace determines our function. You can't function outside of your grace determination. You can't. That's why he said, as each of you have received of the manifold grace, uh, 410, put it on the screen. Everybody has a grace allotment. Every believer. You see, uh, it says, as each one of you has received a gift, Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. A gift. So your allotment is by grace. There's a measure of Christ that is given to you that you are empowered to express. That allotment is what grace gave you. And so grace will build us and uh, help us along the way into the manifestation of glory. So we are saved by grace, we are called by grace, we are justified by grace, and we are glorified by grace. Every aspect of your journey as a believer, grace is what empowers it. Because grace is a fuel that empowers God's purposes, both in eternity and in time. I don't know whether you understand. See, um, okay, let me do my best. I'm just because I don't. I don't because uh, see there there are many things that have been taught in certain ways that people don't under, understand scriptures anymore. Okay, but I know you understand. So your journey of of destiny is suited to grace. Yes, that's why I said all things work together for good. For those who love the Lord. Those who are the called according to purpose. When you locate purpose, grace, you have located grace. God does not waste grace. You see, grace is allotted to you according to the divine purpose that is on your destiny. Outside of that, you don't have grace. (laughs) Outside of your purpose, there's no grace. Listen, let me tell you something. Even common sense, when I say common sense, bringing it down to our normal human living. Things that you can really do are things that you were wired to do. Outside of that, you always struggle to do things. So when you look at children, the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. Not the way you want him to go. God is the one who has determined the way the child should go. Because every child comes already packaged 
with twist and bend. With bends, predispositions. Are you getting me? So the child has been programmed to go a certain way. You will know it through his abilities and the thing that he flows freely in. So therefore, if you see that your child is not a science student, you are frustrating him when you put him before the test tube doing titration. Just because he's brilliant. You are frustrating the grace because he, he doesn't have grace for that. His, his encoding, his encoding of destiny is art. That's where he flows. <laughs> but when you see that the child is brilliant, say, oh, go and do science. That is wrong. The same thing is also wrong in the spirit. In the spirit, everybody has grace allotment. So you have to find out your purpose that God destined in eternity for which grace was supplied and let it manifest in time. That is when, that is when you will not be frustrated. So all things are given to help us fulfill the purpose. The call according to purpose. Everything is working together for their good. <laughs> One day I had a dream. I saw one of God. He said, never do anything you don't have favor for. He said, don't be involved in anything you don't have favor for. It was a dream that he told me. I asked some questions. And uh, I put the question before the Lord. And I had this dream. That man of God came and said, he said, man of God, never be involved in anything you don't have favor for. In fact, this message is what helped me to understand that dream. This dream was last year. Because the things you have favor for are things you have been programmed for, wired for. That's why he gives grace to us to be conformed to his image because that is his purpose. There's grace available for you to live like Christ because grace is what empowers what fuels God's purpose. There's grace available for you to fulfill your assignment because grace is what fuels the purpose of God. If you are called as a teacher, that is what you have a grace for. If you are called as a prophet, that is where you have a grace for. If you are called as a helper, that is where your grace is. If you are called as a pastor, that is where your grace is. So you will be frustrated operating in another sphere which you have not been engraced to operate in. It will always breed frustration, you know, bitterness, Many things, many things, because where the path you are on, there's no grace, no favor. And because God does not waste grace, see, God is liberal, God is liberal, but he's not wasteful. God is very liberal, but he's not wasteful. I say you can't exhaust his riches. God is like a rich man, even if you steal uh, his money. He doesn't feel it. <laughs> if, if, if you steal a poor man's money, he'll catch you right now. <laughs> but a rich man with billions of CDs. I remember some time ago there was somebody in the bank who used to take money from certain accounts. And it took a very long time because he targeted some big, big accounts. So if it takes 100 cities, you will not see. Because the zeros are plenty. I get you. So then you take 100 from here, 100 from here, 100 from here. So it, it took a very long time before the bank realized that this guy had really been siphoning resources. But if your money is small, I mean, in a second, virtue will leave you. <laughs> You will know virtue has gone out of me. <laughs> Guys, virtue has left me. Somebody has taken my 20 cities. Virtue. <laughs> virtue has left me. 
So God is so rich that despite all the abuses that we, we abuse his grace, his gifts, he still has more. That's why God doesn't need to bring you down or bring somebody down before he promotes you. No, it's not like that. So stop praying those prayers. That God will bring somebody down before you are promoted. No, he has, a, he has enough, enough resources for everybody. So you can never finish it. So he can give this person an endowment. The person can waste it. And he will not say, because this person wasted it, it's not enough to reach you. And yet, he is not wasteful. So he gives you the endowment of grace to suit purpose. That is why we always come to obtain grace to help. Grace to help. Okay? So, we were not created for struggle. <laughs> we were not created for struggle. Anything you are struggling to do, you don't have grace for. Just, just know that you are, you are, you do, you are, you are treading in areas that you have not been graced for. If you struggle to do it, I'm not saying if it is, it is, it is difficult. No. Something can be difficult, but you will not struggle to do. The struggling is within you. Hello? Listen, it's not everybody. Now, now if right now, you call Elder Derek to come and lead worship or come and give us a solo, is it a difficult thing? It's not difficult. But he may struggle because he does not have the grace for that. So he will see that, number one, he will be frustrated. Because he can't do it. And number two, there's no joy. <laughs> there's no joy. You see, anything that you are doing that there's no joy, watch it. There's no joy. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. If there's no joy, watch it. Anything that is according to purpose, there is joy. Number one, there is joy. Number two, you don't need motivation to do. You don't, you don't need motivation to do it. Anytime you need motivation, you are treading on a path that you have no business treading on. Take it from me. It's true. Somebody, uh, I think Bishop Wedepo, uh, I was reading his sermon, I think last last two days. Then he said that he went to his university. And then they, they said, Papa, we take coffee to stay awake, to study. What keeps you awake? Then he said, responsibility. He said, responsibility keeps me awake. I don't need coffee. I only, uh, because resp responsibility, the burden that is on him keeps him awake to do his job. So, you were not created for struggle. We were created to freely express the glory of God. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about both our lives, individual lives, and also spiritually speaking. No, no, no struggle. Whenever you see the struggle, you see joy, it's not the byproducts. You have to go to God and ask God, did you really, are you the one who put me on this path? Maybe I've missed, I've missed path. Now, so therefore, grace is the ability God supplies. There's an ability God supplies. That is grace. That ability is time suited to your purpose. That is why anything you are called to do, there's some kind of energy that fuels you to do it. You do it. When the glory choir comes to stand here, 
sometimes when I come to stand here, I expect them to bring what they are doing to an end. But that is where sometimes they are, they are even lost. And I have to prompt them. Because they enjoy what they are doing. It's not as if they enjoy us in the songs. But there's some kind of refreshing that comes when they are doing what they are called to do. And so they have to be checked. Otherwise, they will take all the time. Gloria was telling me that sometimes she's frustrated when she, she starts worshiping and she's interrupted. And I said, go ahead and create your own program. <laughs> <laughs> create your own program and you have worship and warfare the whole night is for you but here it's in measure the grace is in measures when Elder Emma is leading opening prayer and, and sometimes I don't know whether you know once he, he takes the mic he doesn't want to put it down and he, he forget he thinks that we are all watchers <laughs> <laughs> that would say, so grace is the building substance it's God's ability Fabita 4 10 to 11 uh, we read 4 10 so we can just continue okay from, from verse 10 as each one has received a gift minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. When you hear supply, you will remember who? The Holy Spirit. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, grace is the ability God supplies for his purpose and I said even though God is lavish in his spending and he is liberal in his giving he's never wasteful he, he doesn't like waste and so grace to us is measured is given to us in measures it was only Jesus who was giving the spirit without measure in John 3 34 Jesus was giving because he, Jesus was, grace was not measured to him he is grace. The fullness of God's riches was in him. He said that for he whom God has sent, talking about Christ, speaks the words of God, for God does not give him the spirit by measure. But we, all of us, grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So grace is measured to you, supplied in measures that is why we must always come to receive a dose. So grace is as much needed to mature us as it was needed to save you. Do you know how you know you have entered into a new season? New grace is supplied. Fresh grace is supplied. Because I said that grace is suited to purpose and is measured to God's purpose at, every, at different seasons and different levels of your work with God, grace is released for you to fulfill God's purpose for you, your life in that season. Grace is released. That is why grace is what determines changes in seasons. You can die at the brook cherry and uh, complain against God. Meanwhile, the season for cherry is over. So there's no grace for cherry. You know where I'm going. Elijah, when Elijah said that uh, there will be neither rain nor dew for three and for three a half years, as according to my word, then God said, okay, go to the brook chariot and stay there. For I have commanded the ravens to feed you. And the ravens were feeding Elijah 
morning, evening, with meat. And he was drinking from the brook cherry. There was no frustration. There was drought and farming, but there was no drought in him. No frustration. Then God came and said, Arise, go to Zarephath, for I have commanded a widow there to sustain you. Now Elijah can stay at Cherith and will be great deficient because the ravens will not come again. Now the system of God's supply has changed. Now it is not ravens feeding you, it's a widow feeding you. So, Elijah is a chariot. Ravens are not coming. He's complaining to God. Why are the ravens not coming? God, you are wicked. You don't think about my life. Why have you stopped? Have I sinned? Have I done anything wrong? The ravens were coming by. They have stopped. And God is saying that seasons have changed. Grace has been released for your new season. There's no grace in your old season anymore. So you are functioning outside of grace. And so you are grace deficient. You must be grace sufficient, not deficient. So grace is what distinguishes one season from another. Elijah's assignment required that he will be fed by a widow. Ravens and widows. Elisha's assignment required that he will be fed by a rich woman. The woman of the, the Shunammite woman. And yet it was grace at work. The same grace at work individually according to their individual purpose. So that's why it is very, very bad to compare yourself with people and then to try to copy fruit. You'll be frustrated. You, you must know your allotment and your grace allotment flow in it. When seasons change, God will change the supply of grace. Sometimes the instrumentality will also change. But what, while one person is being fed by a rich woman, the other was being fed by a widow, and yet for both of them, there was no dryness. There was no, they were all sufficient. So, that's why we need to come to the throne of grace all the time to receive help. That, what is, what is my measure that you have given me? What are you doing in my life this season? Am I fighting against the season? You, you, you can fight against God's season for your life, but you will end up fighting against yourself. Because God's season in your life, you are, you are supposed to release, manifest his, his purposes at every season. And the, the grace available for that season is given to you. Seven things you need for every new season. As you pray, when God shows you that this is a season that you have entered in, you pray for the faith for that season, power for that season, boldness for that season, favor for that season, finances for that season grace for that season and I've given you how many? six okay the, the next one I'll give it to you next week okay so I've given you grace what Favor, uh, wisdom, yes, wisdom, the seventh one. So, whenever you hear God say, 
you have entered into a new season. You, you must start looking for these things. The, the grace for the new season will have to come with these things. So grace is supplied in measures. Measures. To each one, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. According to the measure of Christ's gift. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 13. 10, verse 13 to 15. This is Apostle Paul speaking. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere, which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. Verse 14. For we are not overextending ourselves, not going, going beyond grace. God is a measure. You don't have to go beyond your grace. Don't go beyond your sphere of, your, of authority where you have been authorized to function. Because there will be no grace for you. Because grace is what authorizes function. Hello? Anytime you are going beyond measure, you are going beyond grace. You must stay within your measure. That is where what you have been engraced for. So Paul was saying that I will not overextend myself beyond the measure given me. He said, for it, as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that, it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. Okay, he said, um, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. The word sphere is the Greek word metron, metron, M-E-T-R-O-N. It means demarcated area within which you can function. Never attempt to do things you have not been given grace for. You will, you will be frustrated. God gives us grace to each one according to his several ability. He says, every man gave talent. Talent was money. He gave one, let's say five CDs, or let's say five CDs, one, two CDs, one, one CD. To each one according to his several ability. Grace is given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, grace is a distinguishing factor between two people. What you have been graced to do, I may not be graced to do it. So I must determine my metron, my demarcated area, for that is where grace is supplied to function. It's not everybody who has been called to do something, the same thing. You can be two people called to preach, but different, 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 different systems, different wirings, different mechanisms, different demarcated areas. Stay within the boundaries of your grace. And don't, don't go beyond your measure unless God enlarges your measure. And when God enlarges your measure, the, 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 the requisite grace is also released. Hello? You see, when the apostle Paul was going beyond measure, he attracted a messenger from Satan. Second Kings, Second Chronicles, uh, Second Corinthians, chapter twelve, verse um, seven. And lest I should be exalted above measure, you see, measure is very important. Above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. There's an extent to which you must be exalted. Don't go beyond that. The moment you operate outside your authority, you attract attacks. If God has not called you to take on principalities and powers, 
and you have no grace for that, and you attempt that, you can be you, you can attract attacks. Even though he said, when he said you shall cast out devils, it, it's demons we cast out. Powers and principalities, we wrestle with them and dislodge them. We don't cast them out. That's why some people will attempt to do certain things and then they will die. And everybody is like, well, Jesus said all authority has been given unto us. No, no, you are reading the scripture just from one side. Grace is released according to your metron, your sphere of authority. Who authorized you to do that? Who authorized you? See, it's not everything. You see, when we say by faith, I will explain to you. Um, do you know that there are certain things that you have been authorized to do, or you have not been authorized to do, even though they are not wrong? It's just outside your measure. So you must know your metron, your demarcated area. For which grace has been released. And flow accordingly. Flow accordingly. I was telling somebody. I said. It's not every. Man of God. Who is called to traveling ministry. It's not everybody who is called to itinerant ministry. To be traveling up and down. Not everybody. If you don't have grace for that, you will, go, you will go and come and you will not like what will, hap- what, what will happen behind you. It's not every couple who have been called together to travel. If you have not been called together to be traveling from one place to the other, you are putting your home in danger because there's no grace. You are functioning outside your grace. So you are exposing your home. But when you have been called to do that, there's grace available to keep your back. So it's not everything that we copy when we see people do. That we, oh, once you are a man of God, you should be doing A, B, C. It's not true. You have to know your grace allotment. And function within it accordingly. <laughs> Never function outside of your perimeter of grace. Now, the economy of grace is the economy of help. Is the administration, the, the dispensation, the release of help from above into our endeavors. Help from above. That is grace. The economy of grace is a release of help from above. That's why it said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. That we will obtain mercy and to find grace to help in, our ta- in time of need. To find grace to help in time of need. Help from above is needed because of our human weakness and deficiencies. That is why it said, he gives more grace to the humble. And resist the proud. Do you know who the humble is? The humble, the one who acknowledges his, his, his deficiency and asks for help. The prayer that God will, will always answer is a cry for help. Yesterday, I was teaching my family about help. The, the simplest prayer you can pray is, Lord, help me. So, so I, I told them that anytime you are in trouble, even before you pick a phone to call a human being, just say, Lord, help me. His name is help. The Holy Spirit is called helper because he's a supplier of grace. Grace is help. And the help I'm talking about, I'm talking about strategic help, timely help, relevant help, not just any help. And I gave them an illustration yesterday. I said that, imagine I'm driving and my car has developed a fault. And people are coming around me. And they are all coming to sympathize with me. Oh, oh, 
We are sorry. Oh, we are sorry. That, that is not relevant help. I don't need that help. When, when one comes and the person says, what is happening? Open the bonnet. Then he does where A, B, C, and the car moves. That is relevant help. All the others, they came to help in a way, but their help was not relevant. One day, my car had a fault, and I was traveling from Kumasi to Accra. I got to a place where, where the radiator had a problem, so uh, they removed it and then welded it. And when, I, when, when they finished, it was like 5, 5 p.m., and it, it was around in Koko. So I continued, went to Accra. When I went to Accra, I go to Accra around 8. When I went to Accra around 8, when I was in traffic at the Kwashi, the thing came again. The, 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 the thing broke again. Because they had not welded it well. So I parked my car somewhere at the Kwashi runabout. Then I was seated in the car. Because everybody was in the car. There was a lot of traffic. Everybody was... No, but I was on the side. Then I saw two, two men coming. One of them, the, you know, your hair, your hair, I told you that your hair shows what is in your mind, right? <laughs> when I see your hair, I will, I will now decide whether you are, I mean, you are this or that. Not the ladies, not the ladies, I for ladies hair, but men. <laughs> this guy had done some, some, something on the hair. The two of them, as they were approaching me, I was afraid. I said, what is this? And the place was quite dark. <laughs> they came and said, ah, why? Why? You got a problem? I said, yes. They said, what? I said, we're eating. They said, oh, this is the type of car we, 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 we work on. Open the bonnet. So I opened the bonnet. They did A, B, C. Then they were, the, the, the thing stopped for a while. They were to go and pack in their workshop for them to do it the following day. That is relevant help. <laughs> relevant help. I'm t- I see, we, we need help that is relevant. I mean, what you are, see, that's why when you come before God for help, God will give you help that is strategic, timely, and relevant. There are some help that is not timely. Like I said, somebody is dying. Bring money for us to save the situation. Then you are looking for money. By the time you come, the person is dead. You have brought help, but it was not timely. That's why I would say God is a present help in time of need. Present help. A time of trouble. When Hagar was in the wilderness and she was dying of thirst, God opened her eyes. She saw a pool of water. Present help. A time of trouble. That help you need, you can only get it before the turn of grace. That's why if you believe in grace, you will be prayerful. The, one, one, of, one sign of humility is prayerfulness. Oh, yes. One sign of humility is prayerfulness. When you know without his strength, you can't make it. It means you are humble. But when you think that, oh, yes, I've been preaching for a long time. I can just go and stand there and say things. You know, that's why I told you that any, before I come and stand here, I invest hours and hours into prayer. Yes. Before I stand here, I invest hours and I'm not praying for anything. I'm praying for spiritual words to communicate spiritual truth. I'm praying that God will have mercy on me that what I will release will be life. Because somebody is here, the person is is waiting for a word from the Lord to be able to take a step. Anytime you see that Expectation is high. Ask for God's mercy. Ask for God's mercy. That's why when you are humble, you will be praying. When you are not humble, they give you Bible study outlines. Oh, 
I should be taking the pulpit, not Bible study outline. I mean, these things, you will even spend time to even re- uh, to pray. When they say, go and take care of the children, I'm not a babysitter. I mean, uh, with some of us, we are anointing, we are anointed to pray, to take the nations. And you are saying I should t- take care of children. But the humble one will pray even for grace to do that. For grace to even stand before children and minister to them. It takes grace. By the way, if you don't have the grace for that, you'll be frustrated. Because there is a metron, is a metron that must be allocated to you. Otherwise, you'll be frustrated. You will go there, you, you, you'll be frustrated big time. <laughs> so timely help relevant help we have to pray for that always all the time whenever you go before the throne of grace you go to obtain help never be afraid of God never be afraid of God be afraid to be without God hello Ah. Uh, I, 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 I saw as, uh, somebody say something. He said that the fear of God is not to, to fear to come before him, but to fear to be without him. That's the fear of God. When we say you fear God, the fear is I'm afraid to be without him. I'm afraid to take a step without his backing. I'm afraid to, to because you see, you, you are graced according to purpose. When we come before the Lord, you must acknowledge your deficiency. Yes. That's why brokenness is what attracts grace. It says he gives more grace to the humble, to the broken. It said, Ah, the spirit helps us in our infirmities, weakness. What is the weakness? For we do not know what to pray for as we ought to. That's the weakness. We don't know what to pray for as we ought to. So we need the help of the spirit. So the spirit himself makes intercession for us through us with groanings that cannot be uttered in articulate speech. Our weakness is that we don't know what to pray for as we ought to. That is why we employ the help of the Holy Spirit. That's why we speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is like this. You don't know what to pray for. Listen, when we say speak in tongues, what we are saying is that stay in his, in, 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 uh, in his presence and know what to pray for. So we speak in tongues because we don't have topics. So you speak in tongues, then you know the topic of the spirit. So when we come together, so let's pray. We speak in tongues. As we speak in tongues, then the Holy Spirit will begin to direct. Now pray for Assumacy. Now pray for this situation. Pray for that. It is speaking in tongues, that is because you are, you, are, you are declaring your infirmity, your weakness. That Holy Spirit, I don't know what to pray for as I ought to. So that the Spirit Himself will start making intercession for you. That's why Paul said, I will pray with the Spirit, then I will pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, then I will sing with understanding. Pray with the Spirit first, then understanding. Because as you pray with the Spirit, then the understanding will come, then the, the direction will come. Pray here, pray this way. That is true prayer. True prayer, spirit, spirit inspired prayer. It's not going to God with, with prayer topics. It's standing before him and asking him, what are we praying about today? But there's nothing wrong going, going, going to God with your petition. But I'm saying that as you grow, you, God, will, God, God will tell you, when you're coming to me, don't come with any request. Just come. I am the one who should direct the business of the day. So as you go, you go before him and then you start engaging him, the spirit. Then he will say, today we are praying for A, B, C. So I'll talk more about that when I talk about standing in the gap. 
the spirit of grace and supplication. It is grace. Supplication is according to grace. So we come before the throne of grace to receive help for ourselves and then for others. For others is supplication. And every believer must be able to go before God with supplication. Don't only go before God with your prayer needs. In fact, let others be first. And you will see how God will find a way of meeting your needs. There's a principle in scripture like that. When, when, whenever you, you go be, be, before God with others, you come out with twice. He said, when Job prayed for his friends, then God turned his captivity around and he gave him twice of all that he lost. When he prayed for his friends. And I will show you the reason why that is so powerful. So, the help can also be in the form of gifts. Gifts. Okay. Now we are getting there. Gifts. So the economy of help, economy of grace, is the economy of help, is the economy of gifts. Gifts. That's why the Father has gifts, the Son has gifts, and the Spirit has gifts. It's an economy of gifts. Three things. The Father's gift is Christ. He has only one gift. Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave. So he gave gifts to the world. Then he gave Christ also to the church. The Son has gifts. In Ephesians 4, 8, he said he led captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. Actually, the, the original rendering is he gave men as gifts. He led captivity captive and he gave men as gifts. The gift that Jesus gives to the church is the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. These are people that are given as gifts to the body for the perfecting of the saints, for the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ. So these are gifts of grace. Human beings who are gifts of grace given to the church for perfection, for maturity. For the saints to be matured. That is why God respects these institutions. I preached a message on assessing grace at the gate of Zion. You need to go and listen to that message. Assessing grace at the gate of Zion. That these people that God has given as gifts, they have been packaged. Packaged and constituted. You see, I said say something. I said that when God gives you a person as a gift, for instance, I am a gift that God has given to this assembly. Now, I have the grace configuration to enhance your grace constitution. You have been constituted in a certain way. I have been configured in a certain way to enhance your constitution. That is why, you see, when, 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 you, when, when, when you go to a church, when you sit down under any, any grace, now, that grace... It's supposed to enhance your constitution, grace constitution, for you to find expression in glory so that you be conformed, so that you will fulfill purpose and glorify Christ. That is why there's a configuration. Before God will give somebody as a gift, God takes the person through a series of processes to configure him. You can easily despise the help that God has given you. Yes. You can. Do you know why he says, bring all the tithe to my storehouse? Do you know the storehouse? What he's saying is this. That there may be meat in my house. What is meat? Meat is grace. Bible says, do not be established uh, 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 with meat, but with grace in your heart. So, meat in the Old Testament is the equivalent of grace in the New Testament. 
The same way wine is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, but with the Spirit. So they are equivalent. Meat is grace. That there may be grace available when you come. So that when you come, there's grace available. You need counsel, there's grace. You need healing, there's grace. Deliverance, there's grace. You need wisdom, there's grace. You need teaching, there's grace. You need prayers, there's grace. You need a covering, there's grace. If you are here, it means that, or it should mean that there's something in you that you will need words from my mouth to enhance. That is why you are here. So if you are not growing, it means that you are not, your grace constitution is not, I mean, it's not in tune with the grace configuration of the house. It will lead to frustration. So, God gives help in a form of men and women as gifts. That is why it takes a long time for God to raise an apostle. It takes a long time for God to raise a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. It takes a long time. Why? Because the, the grace configuration he needs to be able to supply what you need, what you lack. God will have to work on the vessel. Hello. So, after all is said and done, then we radiate the glory. Radiate the glory. Okay, so the help is in gifts. Apart from the gift that Christ gives. They are gifts that the Holy Spirit also gives. And those gifts are also for the building. They are called gifts of grace, charismata. It's an economy of gifts. The Father gives the gifts in Christ. Christ gives a gift in the fivefold ministry that the Spirit gives the gifts of the Spirit. The manifestations. So Romans 12 verse 6. Having therefore uh, gifts Differing Romans 12, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Listen, having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So the gifts you have is that they are gifts of grace. That is why, and they are all for the perfecting, for the maturation of the saints. That is why God endowed you with an ability to lead people in worship. That is why God endowed you with an ability to serve in the body. That is why God endowed you with an ability to give. That is why God endowed you with an ability to prophesy, to teach, to lead. Continue. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now I will come to grace and faith, maybe next week. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. All these are various gifts the Holy Spirit gives individual members of the body. That is why you must know what you are been endowed with and release it for the building of the body. If you withhold what is in your hand, you are going to answer for it. Because it is grace that was given to you. It is grace. It is given for our edification. Do you know that there should not be any lack of grace in the church? The body of Christ has been designed as an ecosystem of graces 
capable of edifying itself, building up itself in love. Do you know the body can build itself? The fivefold ministry, they have been given grace to perfect, mature. But that every believer has grace to release for the building up of the body. The body can build Ephesians 4. Let me let the Bible talk. Ephesians 4. Um, okay, from verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, you may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. I preach a message titled that which every joint supplies. You can also look for that message and, 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 and listen to it. <laughs> hey. hmm. According to the effective working, listen, by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying building of itself in love. The body has been designed to build itself in love. How? By individual members having different graces, releasing those graces for the building of the body. That is why every believer should be body-minded, not individual-minded. He said, let him who operate against the spirit, let him operate to edification of the body. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So, any gift you have, you must know, number one, it's a gift of grace. Number two, it's not for you, it's for us. The gift that you have is not for you. Is for us. So we must place a demand on that gift. That is why I have not been called as an apostle for myself. It's for you and for other people. Okay. First Corinthians 14 verse 12. Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church. That you will seek to excel. So the reason why you want God to endow you or you, 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 you have an endowment of grace to heal is for the building of the body. So there should not be any lack in terms of grace in a church. The reason is that the body, people have not been trained to acknowledge their grace allotments and how important it is and how crucial it is and how how dangerous it is to withhold. If you withhold something from the body, you know, the Lord taught me something. When a part of your body goes on strike, it is called stroke. When a part of your body goes on strike, it is called stroke. Your hand has gone on strike. So your mind cannot instruct your hand anymore. And so when we say, your mind, your mind says, wave your hand. The hand says, I won't wave. I'm on strike. Anytime your body part goes on strike, you, you suffer stroke. And the Lord said to me, When you go on strike, it is I, Jesus, who suffers stroke. And eventually, that part will die, will will, will, will wilt. So the spirit of death, stroke is the spirit of death in the body, in a part of the body. That is why everybody who has a grace allotment, because grace was transacted from the throne, you are going to give account of your stewardship. A time will come where you will give account of your stewardship. Because God is liberal but not wasteful. Whatever endowment God gives you, you are going to have to account for it someday. Not only in in, in judgment, not before the throne of Christ. On earth here, you will account for it. 
Before God will promote you to your next level, you will give account of the grace he gave you to use for this level. Have you used the grace sufficiently? Has it been dispensed sufficiently into the body? Have you put it at the disposal of the body? That is why when God gives you, gives you a gift, it is a burden. It's a responsibility. It's not, it's not a true, it's not a toy. It's not a toy for amusement. It's a tool for the work. It's responsibility. Do you know, do you know how God can grace you and you cannot live a normal life? People sometimes think that, oh, well, well I, just, I, I want to stand here and preach. Hold the pulpit. Do you know the responsibility? Do you know your life seems to be normal when God calls you? Do you know you can't do what everybody does? You can't sleep like everybody? Do you know you have to put in extra measures to stay full all the time? People are tapping grace from you all the time. I need prayer. I need counsel. I need direction. And you have to stay full all the time. You can't live a normal life. You let God put a burden for this nation in your heart. Or a burden for just one family on your heart. And see whether you can sleep like every other person sleeps. Whether you can do anything you like. Anybody can do anything and go scot-free. You, you cannot do the same thing because of the, of the grace of God that is upon your life. So Paul said, it's as if God has set us the apostles as the last. He said, as the scum of the earth. He said, God has displayed us. First Corinthians 4. Paul said, beside this, the burden of the churches. He said, the daily, that comes upon me daily. Who is weak, and I do not, I'm not weak. Who is made to stumble, and I don't bear with indignation. There's a burden of grace. Grace comes with burden. It comes with responsibility. When God touches your heart to be an intercessor, it's a responsibility. It's a burden. You can't, you can't live a normal life that anybody is living. That's why if you think that God has called you and God has given you grace, then make sure that you don't receive the grace of God in vain. Are, are you holding back what belongs to us? It's not yours. Don't deceive yourself. I'm anointed. My, my, my anointing, my gifting, my, my, my calling, uh, my office. No, no, it's not yours. It's for us. You are anointed for us, not for you. What you know how to do, that grace upon your life, that gives you special ability. That ability is not for you. It's for the body. It's for service. It's for, because number one, you did not do anything to receive. It was given to you freely. He said, what do you have that you didn't receive? Whatever you have, whatever ability you have was given to you by God. It's a gift of grace. But grace will be accounted for. He said, after a long while, the king came back and settled accounts with them. Matthew 25, 19. He said, the one who had five talents, five cities, he said, you gave me five talents and I traded with the five and I got five more. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will make you a ruler over much. That is an added responsibility. Growth in grace is growth in responsibility. When God gives you increases the endowment upon your life, it's a responsibility. The, the, the reward for hard work is more work. He said, good and faithful servant, I've made you a ruler over ten cities. You were, I gave you five, but I've increased the number of cities under you. That is a greater responsibility. So, the, the higher you go, if you like, the greater your responsibility. That is why, that is why, if it is a true grace of God, it will not make you puff up. 
it will make you humble. Every grace of God will make you humble. Because in the first place, it's humility that attracts grace. He gives more grace to the humble. But it takes more grace to be humble. So, the authority you have is not for you. It's for us. That ability is for us. Don't put a charge on it. It's not yours. It's ours. Don't put restrictions on it. It's not for you. It's for us. Put it at our disposal. Let's have benefits of your grace. Otherwise, you will see some, somebody will be grace deficient because his, his grace is in your pocket. That is why whatever God puts in your hand, release it. Don't withdraw your hand. Don't be like a um, uh, 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 Perez um, uh, brother. What was his name? Who came out first and withdrew his hand. Then Perez broke through and came out first. Don't withdraw your hand. Release what is in your hand for the building of the church. The building of the body. Otherwise, you are going to account for it one day. When you are put on a scale and you are called to account, that is when you will know that you have wasted grace. Grace, God is liberal, but God is not wasteful. Paul said, I, the, do not receive the grace of God in vain. You can waste it. He said, but his grace that was given to me was not of none effect. Why? Because I labored more than they all. Yet not I, but by the grace of God. Any grace that God gives you will never work without faith. I'll talk about that next week. Let's be on our feet. We should be humble and know it's not of him who runs, not of him who wills, but of God who shows mercy. Mercy is God's platform in dealing with human, human beings. Mercy is set to time. The throne of grace has two legs. Mercy and help. Mercy and help. Help in time of need. Strategic help. Relevant help. Timely help. We need help. We need help. Don't think you are smart. You need help. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him your acknowledgement of him is an indication of your humility the extent to which you trust him is the extent to which you acknowledge him therefore a humble person is a prayerful person who knows without you i can do nothing without you i can paul said i am what i am by the grace of god without you what i would do is called nothing Without you, I can do nothing. That is one lesson that we must learn. We must not wait till we get to a point where we are humiliated. We must humble ourselves. Humble ourselves and receive more grace. Grace of his fullness. Have you all received grace? Grace upon grace. Grace for grace. Which means you can receive more grace. More help more ability let's pray we have come to a prayer throne of grace we are praying oh God help me I need help help me help me you are not you are not you are not seeking help this is not how we, we seek for help you are not desperate enough for help what you are doing is, a, is just showmanship. You are not desperate enough for help. Look at Jesus. Hebrews 5, 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his godly fear. Open your mouth and cry out to him for help. Oh God, help me. I need help. Help from above. 
I need help to sustain me. I need help to enable me. Help to prop me up. Help to put me over. I need help from above. Mandela Makosi Kreban Telemolos Yembala Maha Sikro Torobo Siteres Oli Andere Makoli Baha Mandere de Kosi Kehala Ibala Makosi Brahandes Mandere Mokosaha Help from above Help in all your ways Acknowledge Him Solomon said, Oh God I'm a child. I don't know my left or my right. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding that I may lead your people. I may discern righteousness and justice. And the Bible says, this prayer, please the Lord. It says, Solomon, because you have asked for this thing, this thing, because you have declared your need for my help, listen, you must call God for help. Call God for help. It's not automatic that you receive help. You must ask for it. He says, come boldly before the throne of grace that you will obtain mercy and find grace to help. If you don't come, you will not find grace to help. Help can be wisdom. Help can be counsel. Help can be wisdom. You may need wisdom for the next level. Wisdom for the new season. Wisdom. Help is a knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, Paul said that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, increasing in the knowledge of God, being fruitful, Unto every good work, it all comes as a lot of help. It all comes down to help. We need help. Our God is a present help in time of trouble. God help us. God help us. For the Spirit Himself helps us in our infirmities. For the Spirit Himself helps us. The Holy Spirit is our helper, our paraclete, the one who comes alongside to help, alongside to help, our standby generator. You have to respect him by acknowledging him, by declaring your deficiency and your need for his help. God will not just come on the scene. He has to be called. He has to be acknowledged. You have to need him. Let him know you need him. Tell him you can't make it on your own. I can't make it on my own. I need you. Every hour, every second, every minute, I need you. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. One of the ways God will help you is by directing your path. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. He will direct your path. If the Lord sees that you are humble in heart, He will direct your path. Sometimes He can create circumstances that will lead you to the right place at the right time. Meet the right person. Serendipity. The right place at the right time with the right people. Divine help. Exact help. Timely help. Relevant help. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Your connections can fail. But the help of God can put you at the right place, at the right time, with the right people to get the right help. Help me, Lord. Come boldly, throne of grace, to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. Help can be counsel. Counsel. Counsel can be help. Counsel. I need your counsel. I need your wisdom. I need your advice. Help can be understanding. Understand the will of God. Understand his purposes. 
understand your destiny understand your calling understand your life help can be might the spirit of might might power to break through power to break you through to break through obstacles power to help you scale over walls to scale over obstacles power to surmount challenges that is help that is help that is help help can be knowledge the spirit of knowledge the bible says a man of knowledge increases strength help can be knowledge help can be the fear of god the fear of god will keep you will keep you and will guard you from evil the fear of god will keep you and will guide you from evil we need help we need the holy spirit to help us in our endeavors to help us all things work together for the good for those who love god those who are the called the called the called the called according to purpose the called the called ask the lord tell the lord fill me with the knowledge of your will let me know what you have called me to do let me know your direction for my life let me know your path the path you have started for me let me put me on that path oh god put me on that path let me not wander from the path of life because grace is released to the path that he has started for you no don't function outside your path don't function outside your perimeter of grace function within grace grace flows from a throne it flows from a throne throne of grace it authorizes function it empowers function it determines function grace configures identity determines function authorizes function empowers function thank you lord thank you lord jesus we must acknowledge that we need him if you can do it on your own he will not come on the scene god is attracted to brokenness he is attracted when we call him when we declare to him that without him we are nothing we can't do it when moses said i cannot speak god said i will speak through you god said i will speak through you i didn't call you to speak for me i called you that i might speak through you i want to speak through you when john john saw jesus he fell down before his feet as dead and jesus placed his right hand on him and said hey, don't be afraid arise and i will send you not until we come to the end of ourselves and we see the need for his grace grace will make you a slave because you'll be dependent on him grace will make you helplessly and hopelessly dependent on the holy spirit jesus christ dependent on the spirit of grace he depended on him for everything he did how god anointed him with the holy ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil it was a grace allotment it came because he depended on him he was a man under the influence of the holy spirit we are praying this prayer we are asking god help me to be sensitive help me heal my connectivity heal my sensitivity heal my connectivity help me to be connected help me to be sensitive let's pray in the name of jesus thank you lord thank you lord libra hatala mahalo shele maha mandere boko sitala maha mariana le bahala boko siliala oh libra hatala makoli masitele bos i para da basala maha lo sitela maha con de brete sitele bro to to de ha libra kato salaha Mahimbra tu zile handes, ole kalita la hasonda, aria tala makali, brono sikoro masena ha, ibrede kroto zikretele, ikate ne mokosa, aonde brata kulia na hasaha. Heal my connectivity, O God. Heal my connectivity, O God. Heal my sensitivity, O God. I need help. I need your help. Let me stay connected. I need your help. Let me stay connected. Help me oh God with my distractions. Help me with my distractions oh God. 
let me not be distracted. He said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He set his face up. He set his face up on the joy that was before him. No distraction. No distraction. He said his face was set as a flame toward Jerusalem. No distraction. Help, oh God. Help with my distraction. Help, oh God, with my connectivity. Help, oh God, with my sensitivity. Give me not over to myself, O God. Don't give me over to my selfish desires, O God. Don't give me over to my selfish desires, O God. Have mercy. Have mercy, O God. Have mercy. Don't give me over to my foolishness. Oh God, Imraha Talamaha, Sutelehanda, Ikate, Plato, Silibaha, Anda Rakute, Ikalitra, Palusalanda, Ikonde Baha. Let your mercy restrain. Let your mercy lead. Let your mercy guide. Let your grace empower. Let your grace strengthen. Let your grace empower. In the name of Jesus, we are praying this last prayer. We are coming against the hand that has been released to be kidnapping people, murdering people, stealing people. That hand that has been released over Ghana. We are activating the outstretched arm of God. Let that hand be broken into pieces. Any hand that has been released, responsible for kidnapping, responsible for murders, all that going on in the nation, in the name of Jesus, let that hand wither and die. Let that hand be broken into pieces. In the name, of, lift up the voice and begin to pray. In the name of Jesus, any hand that has been released over this nation, causing kidnapping. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we command that hand, wither and die, wither and die. We cast that hand, that hand of the enemy, to wither and die. We frustrate their processes. In the name of Jesus, we stop their processes. In the name of Jesus, we frustrate their plans and their devices. In the name of Jesus, we mess up their systems. We mess up their systems, their configuration, their protocols. In the name of Jesus, we disarm their power. We render them impotent. In the name of Jesus, we demand the arrest, the exposure, and the arrest. In the name of Jesus, we issue a divine restraining order. In the name of Jesus, we mark our loved ones. We mark our family members. We mark our ministry members. We mark our children. We mark ourselves. We mark our loved ones. We mark our, our, our neighborhoods. We mark our families. With the blood of Jesus, we issue divine restraining order over our loved ones, over our children, our families, our members, all over the country. Divine restraining order. In the name of Jesus, we declare they are untouchable. In the name of Jesus, they are untouchable. Also, we break into pieces that evil hand. Let that phenomenon cease forthwith. Let it cease. In the name of Jesus, we speak as a church. We release judgment on them. In the name of Jesus. Libra hatas, mandere de koshita, holy atalabahalabas, ikaraba. Let them be exposed. 
Let them be exposed. Let them be exposed. Let them be exposed. In the name of Jesus. Let them be exposed. We activate. We activate. We activate. We activate angelic intervention. In the name of Jesus. Let them be exposed. Let them be exposed. Let them be punished. In the name of Jesus. We dismantle their protocols. We dismantle their devices. We crush their base. We shatter their strongholds. In the name of Jesus. The Bible says, the sons of God went, the sons of Jacob went on their journeys and the nations could not touch them because the terror of God was upon the nations. In the name of Jesus, every member of this ministry and our families, let the fear of God fall upon them, around them. Let people be afraid to get close to them, to do them evil. In the name of Jesus, we release a canopy of the terror of God. A canopy of the terror of God. The Bible says the sons of Jacob, they made their journey and the fear of God was upon all the nations and they could not touch them. In the name of Jesus, let it never be said that one of us was touched. Go for pit. In the name of Jesus, we tie their hands behind their back. In the name of Jesus, let their wombs miscarry. Let their wombs miscarry their evil deeds. Let their wombs miscarry their evil deeds. In the name of Jesus, let their breasts be dry. Let their breasts be dried up. That they can nurse their evil intentions. In the name of Jesus, let their sponsors wither. Let their sponsors wither. Let them wilt. In the name of Jesus, let their sponsors depreciate. In the name of Jesus, let their sponsors lose. Let their sponsors be brought down. In the name of Jesus, let their financiers be brought down. In the name of Jesus, anybody who is behind the scenes, Using these people to perform rituals, we release the judgment of God in the name of Jesus. Let their souls enter their own hearts in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We ask for your help, O oh God. As a nation, we need your help. We need your interventions, O oh God. We need divine help. Let the arm of wickedness be broken over this nation. Let the perpetrators of evil be exposed and arrested. Let their souls, their strongholds, and their sponsors dry up. In the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, let your outstretched arm be released to dash into pieces the arm of the devil that is sponsoring kidnapping, murders in our land. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We bless you for what, has, what you are doing in this nation. Ghana will live and not die. The glory of God will manifest in Ghana. Prosperity will come to this nation. Our land will be healed in the name of Jesus. Revival will spring up from this nation in the name of Jesus. Ghana is my jewel, says the Lord. Ghana is my jewel. And our power of prosperity anointing over Ghana because of his apostolic commission. Let Ghana take a place as the first one of Africa. As a gateway to Africa, the beacon of hope in the name of Jesus. Let evil doers and evil planners concerning this nation let them fall flat on their faces in the name of Jesus. And let the church triumph. Let the banner of Christ be lifted high in this nation. 
let the mountain of the lost house be exalted above all mountains in the name of Jesus let the gospel be exalted in Ghana in Jesus name thank you Lord thank you Lord we give you praise in Jesus name Amen thank you for listening to this message for more of these kindly visit our website touchworldministries.com